In this episode, you're going to learn how you can use design systems to deliver better services in less time and with less resources. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, super friends. I'm Dan Mall, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 116. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. My goal with this show is to empower you with the most effective skills and strategies so you can design services that win the hearts of people and business. The guest in this episode is Dan Moll. And if that name sounds familiar, it might very well be because he was the guest in episode 107 where we talked about how to sell design. Great episode, uh, and I really recommend you watch that if you haven't done so already. In the preparation for that episode, I learned that Dan has a big passion next to explaining how to sell design, and that is design systems. That's actually the core offering of his agency called Super Friendly. They're all about design systems. If you haven't heard about design systems yet, don't worry, I'm not an expert either, but luckily Dan is. So in this episode, we're going to explore what are design systems, why should you care, what value do they bring, and how do you actually create them? So at the end of this episode, you'll know how design systems can make your life as a service designer, much easier. If you're new to this channel, welcome, and I'd love for you to subscribe because we bring a new video at least once a week that helps you to level up your service design skills. So if you haven't done so already, click that subscribe button and that bell icon to be notified when new videos come out. That's all for the intro, and now let's quickly jump into the awesome chat with Dan Moll. Welcome back to the show, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to be back. And a happy Christmas. Yeah, same to you. Although over here we say Merry Christmas. Uh, I don't know why it's different, but Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas and a Happy, happy New Christmas Year. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and every to also to everybody who's listening and watching, of course, depending on when you're listening and watching this, then I have to congratulate you on setting a new record. What's that? What What record? What record? You're uh, reappearing on the Service Design Show uh, in the fastest way any guest has has done before. You were uh, also a guest on episode 107. Uh, so that's uh, nine episodes ago. Congratulations on making uh, Thank you. reappearing. I, <laughs> great. I, I feel like uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to also make the fastest record of people getting sick of me the fastest, too. So we'll see. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But um, the last episode was all about uh, sales and selling uh, design. You recommended a great book there that I immediately picked up and, and read The Challenger Sale. Um, really recommend that episode. But uh, in preparation uh, towards that episode, uh, we talked about one of your other passions and that's what we're going to address in um in this episode it's going to be a lot of fun i think we can learn uh, a lot um we're not going to do a 60 second uh quick intro because we've done it already in the previous episode um and the thing we're going to discuss today is design systems now the first question i have already for you then is is it going to be service design systems or is it going to be design systems for services yeah all of those things i think <laughs> and and probably more you know sometimes it's design systems as a service you know mm. is a is a popular concept that's gaining traction so i think we can talk about all the versions of combining the words service and design and system because i think <laughs> we'll have a good conversation about that. awesome looking forward to that so i'm i have seen the concept of design systems uh, coming by. I think it's hard to ignore when you're in the design space, but it's not something that has, I think, um, found its way into the field of service design. So maybe for the people who are listening, including myself, could you give like a brief introduction in what are or what is a design system? 
Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if you don't know what design systems are, you're not alone. Um, and in fact, people who work on design systems also even argue about the definition of it anyway. It's so much so that on our site, at the Super Friendly site, we have a glossary. Um, and so we have like, here's a glossary of terms and we define what the terms mean. And for our, for our design system definition, we even have multiple definitions that other people have set. So the, the, the definition that we use on design systems is that it's the smallest set of components and guidelines that your organization needs to make digital products consistently, efficiently, and quickly. Mm. Right. So and there's, there's a lot of concepts packed into that. So it's not the simplest form either. And then there are lots of other definitions around that. But that's that's the place that we generally start. It's basically the smallest set of things that you need to make stuff to make stuff. OK, we're going to dive very deep into that. Now, then I, when I was preparing my notes uh, for this episode, I'm always curious. When did you get excited about design systems? What what triggered it for you? What led yeah, you sure. down this path? Um, I think there's, there's two answers to that. One is that I think as a designer, you know, I, I went to design school, so I was trained as a designer. Um, and I think designers are generally trained to think in systems anyway. We don't call them design systems, but you learn about systems. You learn about type typographic systems and you learn about um, systems of interaction and you learn about systematizing things, whether that's a brand or that's a design language or things like that. So I think as a designer, I think every designer has, or at least formally trained designer has some affinity towards systems. And then the second version of the answer is that probably five to 10 years ago, somewhere in there, the term design systems in digital has become a more popular term that means a very specific thing um, and so we've always kind of done that work we just didn't really call it design systems it used to be called you know style guide development style or style guide driven development or you know component libraries are kind of a part of that and like a lot of people in digital have been making these things for a long time and it's not until maybe in five years ago or so that we started to really officialize that as a discipline and now there's conferences and a slack channel and like all sorts of stuff mm. around the idea of design systems Hmm. And uh, before people start tuning out uh, of this episode, you promised me that design systems are applicable uh, beyond digital interfaces. That they are applicable to services, uh, right? So we're going Absolutely. to dive into that uh, because yep. I've heard the, the term digital coming by already a few times in this, uh, this uh, chat. We talked about stuff, but we're also going to look at uh, design systems for intangible stuff. Absolutely. Now, uh, what do people use design systems for? Like you already mentioned, we had them, they just didn't have a label. Um, what is the common, common use case for design systems? Yeah, so let's take the word design out of it for a sec. Like what do people use systems for? It's mostly for things that are repeated that you want to have some sort of consistency or efficiency with. So that could be, you know, in digital, that means maybe our interface is going to be, you know, we want it to be more consistent. But if you take the digital part out of that, you know, for a, for a service, you know, you want your onboarding to be consistent, right? And that's a thing that applies to all different kinds of companies, whether digital or not. And so I think that the idea of systems is we do a thing over and over again. How can we not reinvent the wheel every time and instead actually have a process for doing this and have a way that we do this? So I think design systems in general follow suit because a design system is a system. So design system really is a way to do design systematically, you know, or a way to do, if you're talking about service design, a way to do service design systematically, or a way to do any kind of design in a very intentional way. And when you say do design systematically, um, are we uh, talking about the design, doing the design process systematically, or is it something else? It's all of those things, right? And that's why design systems are such a far-reaching thing. And I'll use the context of, of a digital uh, company, um, mostly because it's what I know well, but I'll talk about other things too. So in terms of a digital company, if you're making lots of digital products for people to use, you don't want to do all of those things one by one, each thing individually starting from scratch every single time. It's a waste of time. It's inefficient. It's inconsistent. Um, and so, you know, that's the reason that I think lots of people want systems is to be able to do better things with their time than do the same things over and over again, whether that's designing an interface or it's delivering a particular service or it's having a process for, I think that that's kind of the impetus for all of it. Mm -hmm. And I, like you said, I think we're quite familiar already with, um, and we're going to talk about that, with, with standardizing things, whether it's in a brand manual or style guide, or uh, we, we wanna uh, describe 
in whatever whichever way we can the things that we sort of agreed upon and we can reuse so that we can get to our, the real stuff faster right that's absolutely yeah. and and that's so in in the context of a company you want to be consistent about the design that you're outputting you want to be consistent about the experience that you're outputting you want to be consistent about maybe the code that you write if you're a digital company you want to be consistent about the language that you use whether or not you're a digital so all of those things all of those things can benefit from consistency and benefit from efficiency right. which is why a design system usually is not just relegated to oh that's just for the designers or that's just for the engineers or that's just for the ux folk it's actually for everybody it's for copywriters it's for product managers it's for you know man Managers, it's for directors, it's for everyone. And that's why a design system is such an important thing for an organization. And that's also why it's so difficult to implement very well is because it's not just for one slice of an organization or a company, it's for everyone to be able to use collectively. Hmm. And uh, how, how should we perceive a design system? Like we can understand what our uh, style guide maybe is. I see a... PowerPoint presentation with some guidelines on how to use the logo, which colors, which back backdrops. Um, that's very uh, uh, tied to the specific medium we're using, um, 2D or print or... But uh, how does this work for design systems? Like, what are they? How do, how do, they, how do we make them tangible? Yeah, so, so specifically you, talking about design systems in a digital context, a design system is, it has in it a library, and that's usually a library of components, both in, in a design medium like UI kits and applications like Sketch or Figma or Photoshop or things like that, and also generally have code components too. So some version of coded components, whether that's a React library or that's HTML and CSS or that, you know, whatever languages those are. And so you can think about something like Bootstrap, you know, is, is, this, is a component library and can be used as a design system. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the idea of material design, which is Google's uh, design system that if you open up the Gmail app or the Google search app or, you know, whether it's on your phone or on a desktop computer or wherever it is, all of those, be they look consistent, as at least they do now, a lot of them do now over the last couple of years. And that's because Google has been implementing that design system in all of their products so that whether you use Gmail or you're using Maps, you, you know where the search bar is going to be, you know where the action button is going to be, you know, all of those things are consistent so that you can set expectations well with with users and with people yeah so uh, visual consistency is one uh, and the other thing you already also touched upon is like uh, which is probably much harder to uh, achieve experience consistency Absolutely. like that they feel the same that you're that you that the, that you feel like you're using a google product oh, exactly right and and i think it's important that, that you brought that up too is like it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be consistent more than they have to be cohesive. So there's a there's a guy named Danny Banks who who wrote great articles and he works at Amazon, um, and he he talks a lot about how these experiences should be cohesive across medium, not necessarily consistent. You know, so an example is that we worked with United Airlines uh, last year to to help them with a design system and create a design system for them. And one of the things that we realized was a button when you check into the kiosk at the airport is not the same button that you use on your mobile phone or on the desktop when you log in. It shouldn't be. You know, the, the heuristics are different. The form factors are different. All of those things are different, but it should feel cohesive still. It should feel like it's the same airline, you know, that you're checking into, even though we're not using the exact same thing. So consistency across platform or across medium isn't as important, I think, as as cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can imagine that a lot of people, again, who are listening, um, still see design systems very much tied to digital interfaces. Maybe it's interesting if we dive into a very simple and concrete example and try to unravel how a design system could work in a very physical service environment. Are you up for that? Cool. Yeah, let's do it. Do you have, okay, a, do you so, have an example in mind? Yeah, sure. Uh, so one of the um, classic service examples is maybe a restaurant. Like there is, and these days we are unfortunately don't get the opportunity to visit them as much as we'd like, but I can imagine that it would be fun to explore a design system within a restaurant context. Now, maybe the first question to start with then is, 
what would be the incentive for somebody who's running a restaurant to explore design systems? Is it what you already mentioned about not repeating stuff that you're already doing? I think that's the first the first place, right? The, the first place where a design system becomes valuable is a lot of people realize that they just have a lot of waste, you know, in their companies, whether that's a small restaurant or a giant enterprise, it's just a lot of waste. And, and you waste things when you reinvent the wheel. You waste things when you don't have process. So process, you know, the reason that most companies have process is to make themselves more efficient, to reduce waste most of the time. So, you know, for a restaurant, why would you want any sort of system like that? Well, think about if, you know, if you had to fulfill orders without a system. You know, you didn't have a front of house and a back of house. You didn't have a ticketing system. It would be bananas. It mm. would be, you don't know what order to make. You know, some customer is waiting for 45 minutes while the person who just walks in gets their food. Like you would have unhappy customers. You would have, you would be a mess, you know, in, in the back of house. And so a lot of just system management in general is about getting organized so that you know what you're doing and you can be calm and you can be composed and you can provide a good service and a good experience for your customers. So I think a lot of the impetus for, for design systems initially is just like, how do we do this better? You know, how do we not, how do we, how do we not pull our hair out every time we're trying to do something? And so a system applies for everything from how you fulfill orders all the way to how you speak to your customers. And then, and then it helps really what the, the point of design systems is that it helps with scale. So if you're the only person in your restaurant, you are the chef, you are the server, you're the host, you know, that's one thing. But then when you hire your first five employees, well, they have to talk like you, you know, they have to serve like you, they have to order, you know, fulfill orders like you. And I think a lot of that is about scale, right? So mm. if you don't have those processes in place when you're smaller, imagine now you expand to 10 chains and you have, you know, 100 employees for each restaurant, it's going to be a disaster. Yeah. And, and, you said they have to speak like you and that's not not so much because for instance you would like as a restaurant owner uh, for your employees to speak as you no it's because you want to deliver that consistency and that uh, cohesiveness uh, in terms of experience for your customers right uh, absolutely un unless uh, non consistency and non -co -co cohesiveness is part of your brand experience but <laughs> Yeah, but, I don't but, know any brand that can that can market that you know, chaos. As, a, as a selling point. <laughs> and in fact, the other way around. Or, wait, what, what was? Did you give an example of that? Well, no, I was thinking uh, uh, chaos as a brand uh, value. Oh, right, totally. Yeah, I, I don't know who can market that very well. But but the opposite is true is is very true, which is that a lot of uh, a lot of brands do market themselves on their consistency. Right. Like that's that's the whole point of franchises, you know, whether you agree with them or not. You know that if you go to McDonald's in Berlin, it's the it's the same burger that you're going to get if you go to McDonald's in New York. You know, it's the same it, that that consistency, that brand consistency is an, is important. And I think the same thing is true, you know, for, for every brand. And in fact, a lot of brands have built their brand on consistency, have built their brand on the fact that no matter where you interact with us, this is the tone or this is the style or this is the thing that you're going to get so that you know what to expect from us. And I think that's a really good uh, kind of customer experience tenet is that when people know what they can expect from you, then you're in a really good place. Let's let's uh, let's make it even more tangible. So we understand why we would like to have a design system as a restaurant. Now, how would you start? Let's say uh, I approach you uh, as a as a client, and I you say, "Yeah, sure, no problem. We can help you with that." What would we do in the first few steps? All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with digital and we'll go, go to kind of a non-digital example after that. So in, in digital, uh, the way that most teams think that they start a design system is they go, you know, we need a, a set of standard things that we can just reuse over and over again. And so what they do is they go, well, let's just make those things. So in digital, they go and they make websites that have the pieces, right? Headers, footers, cards, tables, and things like that. And then they try to use them and then it doesn't work because, and well, I'll tell you why, I'll, I'll tell you why, <laughs> why the because um, they end up with a, a design system graveyard is the thing that I call it, uh, where, they, where most organizations have tried to start abstractly and then create something and then it just doesn't work or it doesn't take and people don't use it. So instead, what we recommend to them is don't worry about making the thing first, let it be emergent. So instead, make a product. You know, if you're, if you're a, a, a financial advising company, the first thing you can make is maybe a dashboard for your customers to see their financial activity. 
don't worry about the system part yet. And then after you're done making that thing, then you look at it and go, how do we extract all of the parts from that? We call that piloting a design system. So you think of it like a, like a TV pilot. When, when, when uh, TV shows pitch a network, they pitch a pilot, right? They don't just say, oh, we're thinking about a show that has these characters and these are the situation. No, what they do is they film one episode. And then you can see, oh, that's how it actually works. So same thing is true in, in creating a digital design system and also a non-digital design system too is rather than if you're a restaurant, you know, what I think a lot of restaurants will do is they go, oh, let's, let's write an employee handbook, you know, and we'll define all the things that people should do as employees. That doesn't work very well. Instead, see how employees are actually treating customers and then write the handbook out of that. Go, oh, actually, we see success when all of our servers, you know, recommend a dessert to an, you know, to a customer. And so that becomes a thing that is emergent that becomes part of your handbook is go, all right, now in our handbook, we'll say, these are things that we're already doing. Let's make that consistent. Now let's make that a thing that everybody should do in a way that, that lets it scale. So those are the first steps. Uh, it's a little bit long winded, but those are the first steps that I generally recommend is see what you're already doing that is successful and then figure out how to scale that thing rather than trying to define it from scratch and then hoping that people, will do that thing that that tends to be a, a less um, successful way to do it yeah so, starting from the concrete rather than the, from the abstract now um i can I, I would be curious in a in a restaurant if we start looking for patterns what would be the things that we would be uh uh looking for so, so yeah yeah that's good um uh, I, ha I have this book I was preparing for this this book here by Louise Down Good Services. Uh, you um, mean you mean this one? <laughs> hey, that one right there. That's the exact one. So uh, one one thing that I love about this book is how she talks about you know the the fifteen I think it's fifteen common patterns, common service patterns. And so you know every organization has their own patterns or some some call them principles. You know that that apply across the board. So if I just leaf through the the table of contents here, you know, one of the principles is be consistent throughout principle number nine, you know, one of the principles is set a user's expectations of the service. One of the principles is work in a way that is familiar, right? These are things that apply to just about any business, any service business. So I think all of those things are, are a good place to start. Those are sort of like universal principles of like, if you're on a restaurant, you want to be consistent. You don't like, you, you don't want to, you know, change your tone of voice every day, you know, because pe people don't know what to expect. You don't want to be a diner one day and then you switch to mm. only high end food <laughs> the next day. People are going to be very confused about it. So know what you serve and know what you offer. So I think that's that's maybe a place to start is, you know, what are the patterns that what are the universal patterns that good service businesses can use? And then what are the ones that are actually custom to your type of business? Right. Restaurants have probably different service patterns than, say, you know, pharmaceutical companies or something like that. Um, and then even more specific than that, what are the things about your particular brand that are service patterns? You know, Virgin as a brand has very different service patterns than, you know, American Airlines as a brand, right? And those are those are very different things. So I think those are the, if you think about it as like a hierarchy of needs of patterns, mm -hmm. there's like, what are all the universal ones? And then what are the ones that apply to your industry? You know, and then what are the ones that apply to your specific brand uh, in particular? Would a question uh, like, what, how do... How do customers actually recognize uh, that they are dealing, yeah, that they are dealing with us, not a competitor? And I'm not talking about brand here per se, but in the actual service delivery. So you step into this restaurant or this this coffee bar. How do you actually know? How do you actually recognize in the service delivery that it's specific to this specific restaurant? Right? Would that be a question? Valid question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, I think some of that has to do with brand, but I think some of it has to do with like, who cares? You know, like I, I think that a brand spend a lot of time thinking about how people can think about them as Starbucks or them as a coffee shop or them like, and I think that that's the second question. Maybe I think the first question is how do we provide a good experience, you know, period. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think people will start to, over time, consistency in the experience will start to make them go, actually, I'm going to keep going back to that coffee shop because they always know my order. You know, like every day they already have my order ready for me because I go in at the same day every time. It, it, it reminds me of a story of uh, the Ritz Carlton. Um, and, and at the Ritz Carlton, I don't know if this is true or not or if this is a, a fiction, but at the Ritz Carlton Hotel, they have a policy that every employee gets to spend something like they have $200 or $250 that they get to spend on every guest. So, for example, if you check into the hotel and you forget your shoes, they'll just go and buy you shoes. 
You know, you can say like, oh, I forgot my Cole Hans at home and, you know, I'm a size nine. They'll go buy your shoes. Um, and, and that's that's just part of the service that they deliver. Now, if that only happened once, you could even you could still make the point that like um, that. All right, maybe I'll go back there one more time. But if that happens every time I stay there, then I'm going to be a customer for life, even if it's higher price than their competitors. But that consistency of delivering that is a thing that then I start to associate with their brand. You know, and I think that like from a brand standpoint, I don't mean visual brand. I mean, gut feeling, you know, the feeling brand. that people yeah. have, the experience of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Yeah, and uh, we might get confused here uh, that it's about um, uh, uh, sort of attracting customers, but like you, you like you already mentioned, design systems primarily are interested in increasing uh, efficiency, doing things more streamlined, so that you can actually focus your efforts on the things that uh, require creativity and and other things, right? So uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, my, my friend Josh Clark, I, I cite this article all the time. He wrote this article called The Most Exciting Design Systems Are Boring. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how the, the point of a good, a good design system or the point of good patterns in general is that you don't have to think about those things anymore. Right. right? You don't have to think about them every single time because they're ingrained, because they're already taken care of. And now that you have all this extra time and all this extra mind space, now what do you do with that? Now you can figure out how to go above and beyond for your customers, how to create customer value, because you're not worried about the little things that normally occupied your time. How do we fulfill tickets? Well, that's taken care of now. So now what do you do? Oh, well, now we can figure out how to make our customers even happier in, the, in that way. You mentioned uh, that uh, design systems consist of two things, if I remember correctly, like the components and um, the patterns, the flow, yep. the interaction, right? And uh, I can imagine that totally in, uh, again, a digital setting where you have the visual components, the buttons, and then you, how the screens flow through a checkout page or something like that. Let's take this to our restaurant example. What would be the components or what would be the patterns here? Yeah. So a component, you know, in a restaurant might be something like a fork, right? Like that's like some restaurants have different forks for every table. But most restaurants don't <laughs> because uh, because that's not um, that becomes hard to manage then, right? It becomes hard to order. It becomes hard to have the equipment. It becomes hard to reinforce your brand with the customer. So there's a lot of problems that come from the inconsistency. So instead, what do most restaurants do? They order one type of fork from a supplier. They know they can get it in bulk, you know, and they, they know how to wash it. They know how to how to use it. They know what to set. You know, they know all of those things come with the consistency. So something as small as a fork or a plate or the table or chairs or, you know, all of those things are the components. And then the patterns are things that, uh, that flow, that use the, the components in a flow. So an example of that might be, you know, dessert is a flow that's different than the main course flow or that's different than an appetizer flow. Uh, and so, you know, those are different ways that a server knows how to set a plate down or how to introduce it or how to order it or how to fulfill it. So each of those things have their own components. A salad fork is different than the fork that you, you know, than you, than you eat a, a, a dish with, a main, a main dish with. A, a, a steak knife is very different than a butter knife, you know. And so ha each of those components support different flows and they can be, they can be agnostic across flows, but each of those flows and patterns, I think, use those components. So those are both an important part of a restaurant service. You can't do it without the components. You can't have a service without utensils. You also can't have a service without knowing we're going to have three courses or we're going to have eight courses or, you know, whatever the, the actual patterns become. Makes com complete sense. Now, um, one question uh, I can imagine people would have is, doesn't this take out all the doesn't it take out the human aspect out of, for in this case, delivering a service? What would be your answer to that? Uh, the answer is that if you do it poorly, then yes. But if you do it well, right, if you, if you see it as an enabler. So, you know, one of the things that I talk about is there's two main things in a design system, efficiency and consistency. But the, there's a third thing that, that no one really talks about. And I think that the third thing is relief. So it should provide relief to the people using or in the system to go, oh, I don't have to take care of that. So as an example, my wife and I went out to a restaurant a couple of weeks ago because here in Philadelphia, they're shutting everything down because of COVID. And, uh, 
and so we, we kind of went to a restaurant. I was like, okay, let's do last restaurant for a while. And then we're, we know we're not going to, we'll do takeout instead. So we went to a restaurant and the system, we went to a nice restaurant and the system they had was down. Like they had it great. And so what that allowed the server to do is because he knew exactly what he was doing, it allowed him to talk to us more. And we actually had a really good conversation with him about how when the restaurants were shut down in the last kind of heavy period of COVID here, he and his girlfriend went on a road trip around the U.S. And we talked to him for maybe 20 minutes you know, about that because he wasn't worried about taking our orders so much. I mean, he did all of those things very well already because he knew what he was doing. So it's not that he ignored those things. He knew what he was doing there. He didn't have to reinvent the wheel. He knew the system of how to take orders, how to fulfill them, how to send them back to the kitchen. And then he came out and talked to us and we had a really great conversation with him, which is the experience that we wanted at that dinner was to be able to, uh, to, you know, hang out with each other and also to be, be able to meet people and talk to them about their interesting stories. Like those are the things that made it a great dinner. And so mm. Overall, it made for a good experience for us because all the boring stuff was taken care of. And then we could talk about this thing that was totally not planned, but was just creativity happening in the moment between all of us. It, it freed uh, him in this case to uh, uh, make a difference in the way sort of a human only can. Like yeah. the, delivering uh, your meal in the right way that's sort of the replaceable part like if you teach that to you can teach that to anyone uh having that conversation is the thing that's not replaceable and that's unique and that's providing the experience um is there have you found uh, it's a threshold in as in when does it become too standardized versus when does it become too rigid versus when is there still too much flexibility or is that something that you need to that it need to needs to emerge as well i i think i think it is a little bit emergent but i think that there is some patterns in it as well so when it becomes too rigid is when you're systematizing things that don't need to be systematized All right so from a from a digital context i'll start there um, one of the things that we're seeing with companies that have mature design systems they are in version four or version five of their design systems is that they're actually taking things out of it. They're not continuing to add to it, right? So companies that have 120 components and, you know, 12 patterns in their design system are now for the next version going, actually, you know what, we're going to reduce it down to 60 instead. And we're going to support those really well. So I think that's where it becomes overly rigid is when it gets to a point where you're systematizing things that don't need to be systematized, right? If, if you were, for example, at a restaurant, if you gave a server a script mm -hmm. that, they should, that only they can, they can say that script and they can't say anything else to a customer, well, that makes it cold then. And that makes the experience not good for the customer. You can systematize that. It's possible. It's not a good idea to do that, though, <laughs> you know, because you're removing that warmth. You're, you're, the freedom that people get from having a system, you're actually taking that freedom away. So I, I love how you said the, the freedom. And so I think a design system has to stop where it gives people freedom. You know, once it gives people freedom back, then you can take advantage of that freedom. But if it then goes farther than that, then it starts to remove that freedom again, right? So there's this sweet spot right in the middle there where you're, you're making a system to help people to deliver better experiences. And then if you go too far from there, then you get, you know, a restaurant full of robots, which, which there are, you know, there are. And, and those, are, those are gimmicks and those are fun and cool, but nobody wants to go there every time. Because it's because they miss the human experience, I think. So the things that you can automate, absolutely automate. But there are things that you can't automate, and even if you sh even if you can, there are things that you shouldn't automate. And I think that's the point that that everyone has to kind of look out for. Hmm. hmm. How would you um, how would you again capture a design system in the context of a service? Is it is it a a, a document? Is it a a, a movie is it what would it be in a, in in a in a restaurant yeah sometimes it's conversation right so mm. i think a lot of a lot of design system stuff is about culture right it's about creating culture and sometimes you document culture in things like a handbook or in you know whatever sometimes your corporate bylaws you know sometimes in reference material or style guides or things like that but i think a lot of it has to be lived um, because if it's not lived, you know, how many times is, are people going to reference the handbook? <laughs> you know, like exactly. Like, yeah. So, so if that becomes a dead artifact, then it doesn't matter. Um, one of my favorite restaurant examples is the, the, um, what are they called? 
uh, Union Square, Union Square Hospitality Group, something like that. It's the we group don't have that, them here. <laughs> it, uh, no, I think I think it's they started in New York. I think it's spreading around the U.S. But that's um, they had their their big flagship restaurant is Shake Shack. Um, that's probably their most popular one that would make really great burgers. And they have a couple of kind of like taverns and restaurants and things like that. Um, it started by a guy named Danny Meyer. And one of the things that he realized when he had his first restaurant and then was expanding to two was that people were doing the things that they would do because he was hiring servers who worked at other restaurants. They were doing things that they would do at other restaurants. And he had to constantly remind them, no, 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 that's not what we do here. That's not what we do here. And so, and a lot of that just came from conversation. So as an example, you know, somebody would, um, would be unhappy with their dish. A customer would be unhappy with their dish and they would return it back to the kitchen and the servers would be upset about that because that they were trained to be upset about that at, at the other restaurants. And he had to train them that that's not how we do things here. The way that we do things here is instead we do this. And that he had to reinforce that every single time. And then eventually over reinforcing and reinforcing and reinforcing, then it became part of the culture. Then it became part of, you know, we treat customers with, with delight, with jokes sometimes. So, you know, they had a customer who would order the same dish every time they came in. And one time it was actually, uh, it was not good. Um, and so they sent it back. And so the next time that customer came in and they knew that that customer was coming in because they had made a reservation, they actually set, uh, I think they, they played a joke on them where they set the dish in front of them before they were there, done really poorly, and then you know, so they, they were establishing some rapport. Whether or not that tone is something that you know that gravi- that you gravitate toward is is up in the air. But I think that experience is something where they're they're starting to make a connection with the customer, and they weren't encouraged to do that at previous restaurants. And so the owner of this restaurant said, "Well, this is the way that I want us to do things," and he had to kind of reinforce that message over and over. And then eventually, that became part of the culture that now customers know that brand for for doing. Hmm. So design system in many cases is a lived thing. It has it's an ex- to be. A, a, yeah, experiential thing. Um, is there, I was making some notes here. <clears throat> is there a benefit towards using the word systems versus principles or guidelines or patterns? Like, is there something intrinsic in in systems that people are yeah, adopting it? as much as they are? I think it depends on the on the context. So I think that there are, as an example, we worked with ExxonMobil um, a couple of years ago and we helped them with their design systems. And one of the things that we talk about when we talk about design systems is we talk about how it helps designers and how it helps engineers. When we use the word engineers, they were very allergic to that, to that word. And we we're like, well, why, like, why are you so allergic to that word? And they were like, well, because we have engineers here. And engineers aren't people who write code. Engineers are people who go out and work on oil rigs. And we're like, oh, right. So that word meant something different in their context. That we had to stop using that word because it, it was totally making them think over there when they should have been thinking over here. And so the word system, same thing. You know, some people have an allergic reaction to the word system, either because they don't know what it means or because it has a specific meaning already. So I think it depends on the context where that word means means something. In general, what we find is that the word system doesn't really mean a lot to people. So it so we don't use it a lot. And in fact, we we tell a lot of a lot of um, our team members don't use the word design system because it tends to be a distraction to what people actually care about. You know, what people actually care about in a digital organization is, you know, a rebrand or a replatforming or content migrations or things like that. And when you say design system, all they hear is just not that thing, you know? And so in the context of digital, you know, system means a particular thing that sometimes can be too distracting. And in the context of non-digital in the context of, you know, just any general service system might mean something very specific. Whereas the word principles actually, actually might not. So maybe you have the ability to fill in the definition of that if it's a word that people don't know as much. Hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> it, it's. I, I think it's with a lot of language in the design community. Uh, it, it can distract from the actual thing you're trying to do. And if your client cares about getting great services out the door faster, then that's the thing you need to talk about. And uh, that you're going to create a design system in order to help them to achieve that. Like you might sometimes just want to keep that uh, uh, within your team. Now I'm yeah. curious, like you mentioned that uh, a design system has to be used by everybody. And whose job is it then in the end to come up with the design systems to capture the data, the insights, the patterns that emerge? someone's. Um, 
I don't think it's important who that someone is, but I do think it's important that there is a someone. Because I think the answer can't be, oh, it's everyone's job. Because that's just a fancy way of saying it's nobody's job, right? So I think it's got to be someone's job. And one of the things that we recommend for organizations that have design systems is that you eventually have a team to, to staff it and support it. So one of, the, one of the big mantras of design systems and digital is that a design system is a product. And so it has to be treated like a product. So if you think about, you know, what's a product you use, Harvest or, you know, your invoicing tool or your accounting software, what, how do you sustain that product? Well, the, the product has to have designers on it. It has to have engineers on it. It has to have UX people. It has to have a budget. It has to have a roadmap. It has to, like all of the things. If you think about you, this, a, a product that you use, whether it's digital or physical, care goes, especially digital, care goes into constantly maintaining that, you know, software as a service, design systems are, are sometimes a software as a service. And so it has to be sustained that way, you know, and it can't be like, oh, you know, we'll get to it when we get to it. You know, imagine if the software that you used every day was like, oh, we'll get to it when we get to it. You know, people flip out when Gmail changes something. People flip out when, you know, when, when their email software, like a design system is the same thing. So it's got to be sustained by a particular team whose job it is to sustain that actual product that, 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 that everyone is using. And it's really simple in the end because uh, it's an asset. It's, a, it's an asset to an organization. It yes. helps you, it has a specific goal and that goal is to become more efficient and then uh, have time to do, to do other stuff. So it's not, uh, I can imagine that people see design systems as a uh, cost or an, uh, are afraid of the upfront investment, but uh, yep. that way of thinking it's very short-sighted when you don't consider that design systems should actually help you to run more efficiently, consistently, uh, all that kind of thing. So, uh, totally. right. Yep. What are some of the reasons that you've seen, uh, give me a top three reasons why design systems aren't, uh, adopted. Oh, okay. So, um, Market fit, right? That's that's one that that folks that service design folks will be uh, familiar with. I think it's like market fit. You can make a product, but if it doesn't fit your market, people won't use it, right? And so design systems are the same way. If it's a it's a product, and and the way that they generally start is that people go, oh, let's just make a bunch of things for other people to use, and then they kind of cross their fingers and hope that somebody will use it. That's not the way that you you assess market fit for any product. The way that you assess market fit is you probably are doing customer interviews before you have a product. You're probably defining a feature set that you know the customers are going to use, and then you're going to release a version one or an alpha or a beta or something like that that then serves those particular needs, right? And design systems generally don't start that way. They start as a side project. So thing number one is that they don't get adopted because they don't have the things in it that people actually need to use. You know, so the, well, a lot of ways that we start is we start with interviews. We start by going like. If you had, you know, what are your top three components that would make your life easier? And they go, oh, if we had a, you know, drop down, custom drop downs, and if we had this, and if we had that, you know, that would be great. And we go, cool, we'll go work on those things first. And then you, and then that's when you get market fit. So that's, that's the number one reason is that design systems don't, don't get adopted is that. The second one is usually a little bit farther along where some folks are using a design system, but it's still treated like a side project. You know, so it's like, you know, it doesn't have funding. There's no dedicated person to work on it. And so it just loses steam after a while. That's one side of the coin. There's a, there's a kind of a part B to that. The other side of the coin is it actually is too in demand where everyone's like, this is great. This is awesome. We need more out of it. And then the one person who was in charge of working on it is like, oh, I, I'm too busy to work on this too. So they just get inundated with requests and then they can't fulfill all of them. So people go, ah, we'll just make our own. We'll just use our own thing or we'll go find, we'll use material design, you know, or something like that. So, you know, two sides of the same coin, it's either underfunded and understaffed or it's, or, or there's too much demand, you know, for that, for that person to, to be able to keep up with. So those are, those are the common ones. And then, and then related to that one, I guess this is kind of a third one is um, lack of funding from the top or lack of maybe not, maybe not financial funding, but lack of buy-in. Is it buy-in? Buy Thank yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. You know, if your leadership doesn't care about it, if your leadership doesn't think it's a tool that the rest of the organization can benefit from, they're going to go look to other things. And exactly. so it makes it hard for an organization to adopt that when your leadership are like, ah, we don't care about that actual thing. So definitely buy-in is, is one of the sticking points of a design system. Yeah. And I was thinking like, how do you get buy-in for such a thing? And uh, it's, 
I, I'm curious to hear your experience, but I think I would look at uh, inefficiencies in your existing service offering or seeing opportunities to do things more efficiently and then presenting that almost as a business case and say, hey, look, we have two different service offerings uh, over here. Um, we are doing things differently. Maybe if we look at the things that overlap, we could inc increase the quality in, in do them fast and do them cheaper, something like that. Would that be a viable strategy? Yes, but I think there's a there's a nuance of that because and I, I love the way that you described it. Because what most people do is they go, they have the plan for a design system, and then they go, "Ooh, it would be great if we had this. Let's go get buy-in for it." And so what they do is they put together their you know their talking points, their ROI, their metrics, their all that stuff, and they go and pitch it to leadership. And they go, "If we had something like this, it would save us you know." 10% of our costs on projects or 20% and leadership goes, uh, it would save us that cool. Like, uh, mm -hmm. we have other things that, that we could invest that money in anyway. And it's because you don't have anything tangible to show, right? You have the hope of a plan. It's like asking somebody like, do you want to lose weight? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, cool, you should go to the gym. And they're like, cool, I know I should. And then that's it, right? Like th there's nothing actually tangible about it. So instead what we suggest is this, this is the, the pilot thing. It's like, use it on one product, you know, do, do a design system without the funding, without the buy-in, without the investment, without do it under the radar, do it as a weekend project, do, like do it. And then what you can do is you can go to leadership and you can say, we already saved 10% of the, we, we finished this project six weeks ahead of schedule. Would you like us to finish other projects six weeks ahead of schedule? And they will say, yes, I do. But you already have one use case. You already have a pilot. You already have one episode filmed so that you can show it off and go, this is what the rest of the show is going to look like. And so I think that I, I, that's why I like how you phrase that is you already have to have the service in order to sell it. You can't sell the vaporware, right? You can't sell the like, oh, if we had this thing, it would be great because every no one no one would disagree with that everybody would be like yeah that would be great we're not going to do it though but it would be great <laughs> and so instead if you say we're already doing this now we just need the money to sustain it we need the investment we need the buy-in to sustain it that's a much easier thing for people to yeah. buy i i had a different post over here uh which said uh, no prototype no meeting and i think uh, that goes uh in many scenarios including this one and then uh it's so much easier to you, you don't actually have to sell anything you just uh invite somebody to continue with this uh, initiative yes. which has already proven uh itself absolutely is there a question that i forgot to ask about design systems that i should have asked Ooh. hmm um one of the ones that we get pretty often is how do I know when to stop selling? Right. So like, how, like I think a lot of folks think, well, I need to get buy-in once. Once we get buy-in, then we got buy-in. And, and so I, I don't know exactly what the question is. I don't know what the, what the phrasing is, but it's, it's something to the effect of like, what happens after I'm done getting buy-in, right? Something like that. And, and it's kind of a rhetorical question. The answer is you're not ever <laughs> done getting buy-in. You have to constantly, you know, again, back to the product thing, you know, that's like saying, oh, all we have to do is pitch the product once and then people will buy it for the rest of eternity. It's like, no, 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 you have to continually sell your product. You have to show it to new customers. You have to continue to keep keep your customers by investing in the product, by making new features, by, you know, continuing to solve problems for them. So I think I think the the evangelism never stops. You know, I think that's that's a lot of the, the answer is like, you have to constantly do that. And that's why that's partially why the design system needs a team needs a product owner needs a champion to be able to evangelize the benefits of it to both the people who already use it as well as to new people. Hmm, makes sense. I would love to hear from the listeners and viewers of the show, like, what are their thoughts on using the uh, the concept of a design system onto service delivery because i think that's the main focus have you tried it have you done it um what are your experiences what are the the pitfalls that we haven't discussed why why wouldn't this work in a service context um leave a comment uh, we'd love to to know then i can imagine that some people got excited through this uh, conversation what are some recommended resources to continue learning about this topic? 
Yeah, well, shameless plug. Uh, just released a course um, about design systems to cover a lot of the topics we talked about. Uh, less so about service design, more kind of on the digital front, um, but it's still kind of high level. It's more for managers and directors. It's called Make Design Systems People Want to Use. Um, Because that seems to be the big thing where like lots of people make design systems and doesn't necessarily mean that people are using them. So how do you make one that people want to use? What's the process look like? What does the workflow look like? How do you get buy-in? What do you say? You know, all those things are are ones that that are are covered in the course. Um, So that's just released about a month ago. Um, uh, And if you, I'll share some links to that as well. Yeah, it will Um, be in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Cool. Lots of good books around design systems, too. There's uh, one called Design Systems. It's by Ala Kolmatova. It is a wonderful book. Um, there's another one by Jesenia Perez-Cruz called Expressive Design Systems. Both of those are great books. Again, both of those relate to digital. In terms of non-digital things, there's a great book called Thinking in Systems by D- uh, Danella Meadows. Um, it is wonderful. And it doesn't relate to digital. It just talks about systems in general and why they're important and what things are needed in a system, whether that applies to service delivery or that applies to whatever you're actually doing. What are the connection points and the interconnections that you want to build? So that's a really good one. Um, those are probably my, my three, you know, three or four go-to resources. Awesome. Uh, again, I'll make sure to link all to all the books uh, in the show notes and uh, also to the course highly recommended uh then it was an honor having you uh on the show back on the show i'm curious what episode number three uh will bring because we need to finish the trilogy uh, at some point um yeah once again uh thank you for being on merry christmas and Uh, thanks mark (laughs) have you used design systems in a service context let us know what challenges did you encounter what worked really well we'd love to know so leave a comment down below and let's continue the conversation over there if you know somebody who needs to hear this conversation grab the link and share that with them that way you'll help that person to learn something about design systems and you'll help me to invite more inspiring guests like them here on the show for you. If you want to learn more about how to design services that win the hearts of people and business, check out this next video because we're going to continue over there. See you.